Hey, just want to look into the camera and say welcome to church. This is week three of our Legacy uh, um, series. And uh, so we're glad you're along for the ride. And it's uh, Father's Day today. So I hope that's all good for you. So church, would you welcome all the ones joining us online today? Cool. And I'm going to invite Paul, wherever Paul is, just to come and share. And this will make sense. Um, this is Legacy. You could welcome him if you want. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Colin, for giving me this opportunity. And today I just want to speak a little bit about legacy. And we all know that, we're le uh, that legacy is something we leave behind long after we're gone. But I don't think we are very always conscious that where legacy often begins. It often begins a long way, <clears throat> a long way further back than what we, um, uh, back in the, in the past, than what we, uh, that more, what we really believe. And so, did, so, today, so today I would like to relate a story that dates back about 55 years. Now during the 1970s, I farmed in this district and I attended the interdenominational interdenominational church uh, on Moyer Street. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to speak about today is God's vision for his church in the Mangawai district. Something you may not, have, a lot of you may, I've never heard of. To set off vision, there often needs to be revelation, revelation first. Revelation of what God has in mind and what he wants to accomplish. I want to recall to you the vision that one of the old ladies in the church received. Yes, one of the old ladies, fondly referred to as the Hallelujah Sisters. Her real name was Gwen Gamble. And um, I thought she was old when I was out here in the early 1970s, but actually when I look back, she's probably about 65. <laughs> The year was just prior to the 1970s, about 55 years ago. It was probably about 1968 or 69. The occasion was the Mangawai School Swimming Sports, and the place was the estuary in front of the houses on the foreshore between the two boat ramps, between the, the uh, concrete boat ramp and the, and the sand boat ramp. <coughs> Each class entered the water, um, swam their event and moved out to let the next race begin. As one group of boys was about to come out of the water, Mrs. Gamble pointed to one of them and said to those with her, see that boy there with the dark hair? One day he will lead a big church in Mangawai. 55 years ago. Now, 55 years later, that boy is sitting right here in front of us, and his name is Colin, the leader of this church. Mrs. Gamble shared this personally with me and my first wife about 10 years after the event. There were, after the event. There were others still around at the time who had been at the swimming sports and had heard and witnessed the event firsthand. Today I wanted to share this with you so that as we begin the building of God's house here in Mangawai, you can be assured that this is no accident or work of man, but as a direct leading of the Holy Spirit and the very heart of God himself. So when I was a little boy, the, sw the swimming pool was down there in the ocean. In fact, if you drive out there and look to the left, you'll see still one of the posts remaining. There were two posts and a, and a galvanised bar. That was our kicking bar. And occasionally dolphins would come in and join us for swimming, swimming lessons. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Uh, some of you are thinking, pretty sure you didn't pick someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
I, I think the church is living in the season of the greatest opportunity ever. <laughs> and to be the hope of the world, that's our purpose. Uh, to create a place, uh, not just for you to come on a Sunday morning, I never wanted to create a church that's just for church people. That's, uh, that's uh, yeah. Uh, we want to create a place where we create a place that non-church people are comfortable to come to and to create a place where we can fulfill the final words of Jesus to, to make disciples, to baptize and actually help people walk in obedience to the word. We often forget that one. A play, place where people will experience him powerfully uh, and, and we call it here on a Sunday morning to know God. Uh, to, you need to know him personally. He's a powerful, personal Almighty God. He's a powerful, personal, heavenly Father who can change your life. And once we know him, you need to settle what we, I call what's in the rear vision mirror. And uh, we all accumulate junk in life. And we call it find freedom. And we do that through small groups, as I just explained. And then we love you to help you discover your purpose. Three Sundays, one about how the church functions and its leadership, um, um, your spiritual gifts and your personality type. And it's quite interesting because there's a few husbands and wives come there and they sort of looks at each other's. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay. And we call that growth track. And then, and then we get to this. We want to get everyone in this church to the, to the point, and it's just a journey for everyone, and everyone's on a different timeline. We want to get everyone to the point where your life is making a difference and in the lives of others. And that's where legacy comes in. And uh, legacy is living our lives in such a way where our lives make a difference and can I tell you something God has hardwired you that way that's your DNA and when you hit that spot regardless how insignificant it is in man's eyes or how significant it is there's something in your spirit will light up because you've you're wired that way God's wired you that way and that's the spot he wants you to get to and as your leader I want to get you to that place where we make a difference does that sound good and, and when you read all through the Bible, particularly the New Testament, through the Gospels, through the parables, through the letters to the churches, I notice something. Over and over again, the Bible gives one main, main reason for generosity. And generosity isn't just money. Generosity is your resources. And I say to kids who, who don't have any money to buy you know, gifts at Christmas, just write somebody a, a babysitting voucher or offer to wash and polish their car. And they, yeah, well, there you are. Some people are going to get their car. <laughs> okay? It's not necessarily about money. Yeah, we serve people and we love to help the hurting and we, and we love to help the poor. But the Bible points to this one reason time and time again. And... Uh, uh, referring to the way you live your life on earth and can I tell you there's more to this life than this life the whole Bible uses this one area of motivation for legacy for making a difference for generosity and compassion and the topic is heaven oh okay go back to sleep okay and one day you will give an account Two questions, we covered this week. One, what did you do with Jesus? And what did you do with all the spiritual gifts that I gave you, that I put in you, that God put in you? And in the New Testament, James uses this illustration of a vapor or a mist to describe our time on earth. And this is what I really want to hammer home today. James 4.14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while, and then vanishes away. So that's your allocated time on earth. It's just a vapor. And so we have this small window of time to use our lives to, to, make, to make a difference for eternity. And here's my motivation, heaven. I'd love to do a series on heaven. I was sharing in the worship team in the prayer time. Um, and I don't think I can do a four-week series on heaven. There is so much in the scripture about it and there's so much misunderstanding about it and there's some wonky teaching on heaven but heaven is the reason we do what we do and today we, the takeaway for you is to store up treasures in heaven 
And we're going to have some fun with that. And uh, uh, over the last few years, I've helped with around about 120 funerals. And I've seen a lot of pain. I've seen a lot of brokenness. I've had to help with the, with the funerals for suicide some absolute tragic uh, car accidents and the last one was just a two-year-old, two-year-old boy and that uh, ripped my heart out because I've got two little grandchildren too and the reason they asked me to help them is because it was cancer and they knew that we'd gone through cancer with our boy so that's good okay but I've noticed two different responses during and after funerals one grief misery hopelessness and we address that by just getting smashed. And the other response I've noticed is grief and joy. Woo. People who are both crying and happy at the same time. Even though they've experienced a tragic loss. And to put it into Bible lingo, it's called the blessed hope. And Titus 2.13, while we wait for this blessed hope, the appearing on the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So one group, grief and misery. The other group, know they will see their loved ones again. And just knowing that you have this hope of eternal life and that This hope is a game changer and the the local church is the hope of the world. There isn't a plan B. So turn to your partner and say, there isn't a plan B. You're it. And when you understand that, it changes the way you live your life. It changes your perspective of earth. And U.S. statistics tell me that 80% of people believe there is an afterlife. That includes atheists, evolutionists, and wackos. 13% don't, and 7% didn't know. I just pray these evolutionists realize that God's the glue that holds it all together. Is there anyone here old enough to remember a pop group called The Birds? And they're they're smart. They, They covered a Bob Dylan song. Um, time, I'll think of it in a minute um, and then they covered a song and they just, took, they just stole the lyrics out of the Bible yeah. if you don't believe me look up Ecclesiastes chapter 3 right now there is a season turn, turn, turn and a time for every purpose under heaven a time to be born and a time to die Turn, turn, turn. Really clever. Just don't even have to think of the lyrics. Just steal it out of the Bible and become millionaires. But what they didn't tell you, what they didn't put in the song is the next verse. And this is why people believe there's there's a life after this life. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. God, He also set eternity in the human heart. In fact, in Romans 1 verse 20, God will hold every human being on this planet accountable to know him through creation. We are, to, we are to love creation, but we're not to worship creation. We are to love the creator and worship the creator. And in fact, if you want to read the rest of that chapter, and I suggest you read it in a paraphrase, it's, it's Earth 2023 today. It's pretty juicy. In fact, it's sick. And now you're all going to go home and read it, which was my whole purpose. Okay. Romans 1. In other words, no, you, you are without excuse. Man, we, we came down from the prayer meeting on Thursday night or Wednesday, Thursday night from the office, and that beautiful moon just popped up above the waterline. It was just so big. I didn't see the moon. I saw my creator. And in so many conversations, Jesus and the writers of the New Testament use heaven and eternity as a motivation, a point of focus. And now Paul is writing to Pastor Timothy. Now, this is not a letter to the church. 
This is a personal letter from, from Paul to Pastor Timothy. And he begins with this interesting phrase. And when, and when I'm reading the Bible, just to help you, I always ask questions. So here it is. Ecclesi- uh, sorry, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19. This is kind of grumpy preaching. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, when I see that, I read a whole lot of other things. Who's the command to? Who's the command to? To those who are rich. Why isn't he commanding the poor? Because they've already got it. They already understand it. Can you see that? You don't need to tell the others, Timothy. Just get it to this lot. The other lot, the poor, are already investing in eternity. They get it. Percentage-wise and through church, the the poor are the biggest percentage givers. Command those who are rich in this present world. Guess what? There's another one. Can you see that? Command those who are rich in this. That tells me there's another one. Are you getting it? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant and to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, can I correct some theology wobbly here? There's a, there's a section of the church, and I've come through it, where it says you should be poor, and you should have nothing. That is not biblical. Poverty mentality, not biblical. Read it. It's okay to have stuff, and it's okay to enjoy stuff, as long as the stuff doesn't have you. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This way they will be laying up as a firm foundation for the... Are you seeing it, church? So that they may take hold of this life that is truly life. Now, when I read that, I just see discover purpose and make a difference in that statement right there. When I get into that zone, it's going to light my life up. And there's a life beyond this life, and that's the one we want to invest in. We're all living in this present age, and there is a coming age that we need to get set up for. Why? Why do you need to direct your life towards, towards eternity? Why do I ne- need to direct my time, my energy, my attitudes, my money, my resources? Well, I want to give you three reasons why we need to direct our life towards eternity. The first one is, heaven is my home, not earth. Don't get too comfortable here. Right now, we're heading into a time the Bible calls pre-tribulation, Matthew 24. You can go and read it. And I keep my finger right on the pulse on Israel, exactly what's happening. I can't wait for them to get this new laser um, thing they've got. They can just shoot anything down with lasers. And, uh, and, and they just, um, the undercover Israelis um, infiltrated the Iranian missile thing and they put some false componentry in there so that when all the missiles start raining down on, on Jerusalem, they fail. Unfortunately, the Iranians got to that. But they're moving into the Middle East. It's all coming to a, a head. That's my time clock. Israel is my time clock. Okay. And don't, please don't tell me that the church replaced Israel. <laughs> please don't tell me that. Read your Bible. Okay. Well, I just get so excited I get lost. <laughs> it's going to get bumpy. Hang in there. It's going to be fun. Hold on. This is not your home. It's just temporary. Don't get up so upset about the potholes. It's just temporary. They're never going to fix them. The disciples come to Jesus and they're packing a sad because he's telling them that he's going to leave. Oh. And then he says to them in John 14, 
Colin says it to you this morning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And you would think that Jesus would just say, hey, boys, come on over. We'll do a little, do a little miracle. We'll bring in some KFC wings. <laughs> he doesn't say that. And he doesn't do that. He says to them, trust in God and also trust in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If there were not so, I wouldn't have bothered telling you. And I'm going to prepare a place for And it's not $5,000 a square meter. It's free. Well, one person believes that. And when everything's ready, the father's going to say to the son, go get my church. It's a Buddy Holly song. I'm a shocker. So every time... There was an earthly problem. Jesus directed them to an eternal solution. That's what I want you to see this morning. And we will always pray for whatever situation we will pray and pray and pray. But this is just temporary. And Paul said this to the Philippians in in chapter 3 verse 18. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Hmm? Their Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. So they are focused on the here and now. Their God is indulgence. Now what? There's nothing wrong with enjoyment and there's nothing wrong with having stuff until it becomes your God. Why Paul called them, why did Paul call them the enemies of the cross? Here's the answer. Their mind is on earthly things. Everyone say this, but ours. That was pathetic. (laughs) But. (laughs) Right. The Philippians could have identified this because they're colonists living in Rome. You are currently living away from your place of citizenship. Heaven. And Paul goes on and we eagerly await a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a rooster called uh, Randy Elkhorn, and he wrote this book called the, the Treasure Principle. And I know when Mike Tonks preached here, he did this, illustrated this with a rope, that your life's just this little dot on this rope, and that rope just goes forever. So there should be a picture there. Okay, turn to the person and tell him you're the dotty. I mean, you're the dot. <laughs> you're the dot. And the line goes forever. So the dot is your allocated time on earth. Heaven is our home, number two, because the line is longer than the dot. Do we focus on the dot or do we focus on the line? The Bible praises and honors people who live life this way. Hebrews 11 is a a challenging, it's kind of called a a faith chapter. And it gives a great, perfect example. I'm not going to spend time on it. But the first part of the chapter, life on earth worked out for those people. But for the latter part of the chapter, life got ugly. And it was actually brutal. Brutal. And they were tortured and killed. And yet it says in Hebrews eleven fourteen to 16, people who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their... Now, when I use a paraphrase by a passage, I'm just trying to bring the illustration to life to you, okay? I don't normally use a message, but that's it. Their focus wasn't on earth. Where was their focus? Heaven. They were after a far better country that, than that heaven country. You can see why God is proud of them and has a city waiting for them. Heaven is far better. It will be a perfect city. No traffic. No traffic lights. No speed restrictions. (laughs) 
For those watching online, you may not have heard that, but there's a certain troublemaker called out no cars in heaven. Can I share something with you that's going to shock you? You are not going to spend all your time in heaven. What are you talking about, Colin? You're talking about we're losing our salvation? No. God says he's creating a new heaven and a new... I can't wait. It will be perfect. It will be sinless. Perfect weather, perfect everything. The lion and the lamb lay down next to each other. KFC always open and free. The fishing will be perfect. Why should we focus on heaven? Serious. Right now we have limited time, but incredible opportunity. Right now we have limited time, but incredible opportunity. I'm 66 years old. I know you can't, please. <laughs> Little booty. <laughs> what I've got left is less than what I had. Anyone know how that feels? Okay. It was funny what Paul said, because when you look at your parents, you think they're old buddies. And then when you're there, you kind of think... Oh, they're cool. (laughs) But I have limited time to do incredible opportunity. You know, I I see a day, it won't be my season and it won't be Anne's season, but I see where legacy will actually be millions of dollars. We'll be on missions, we'll have teams of missions going out, we'll be building around the world, we'll be changing, making a difference in the lives of people. This church will always have more vision than resource. That's how it should be. And, but there's incredible opportunities. And in Ephesians 5.15, it says, Be very careful in how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of... Oh, it's in the Bible. <laughs> because the days are evil. I don't even need to tell you that. Can you see it just spiraling? I, I, I never was a history buff, but I am a bit now. And I love... Uh, reading about the Second World War and Winston Churchill. And I love learning about that campaign where the people gave to board Spitfires, to build Spitfires. And um, who's it? any James Bond fans? Five, okay. Oh, man. Skyfall? Part of Skyfall was filmed in Churchill's bunker next to Parliament in London. You can go and visit it. It's a touristy thing. And if you go in there, Winston Churchill had this poster produced for all of England during the World War II. They had to defeat an ugly Satan enemy across the ditch by the name of Adolf Hitler. Can I just have another little political shot here? What did Hitler do? What was the first thing he did, apart from use little girls with pigtails? He controlled the media. Here's the legacy poster. This is my legacy poster. He's saying to the people of England, this is not the time to party up. This is the time to make a sacrifice so that we can party up. Am I allowed to say that? Self-indulged at this time is helping the enemy. Now, don't take this wrong. It's okay to have stuff, even V8s, if you can afford to fill it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's in the Bible somewhere. I'll find it. <laughs> Who cares? And I think this is the season for the church. This is legacy. What an incredible opportunity to do, and we just need to just have a measure and pull back and let's, let's build kingdom. And... He's basically saying there's in time to enjoy stuff, but right now we have an enemy that needs to be defeated. 
Oh, Colin, that's better preaching than they're responding. Oh, I can't, but it's okay. That's an amazing spiritual truth. The fourth reason we need to direct our lives towards eternity is because it's just smart. <laughs> it's just smart. It's a smart way to live. Jesus said this in, in, in Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. That's the best insider trading you'll ever get. If you want some insider trading tips, it's right there. It's okay to have earthly investments. Money's good. Don't get that wrong. The love of money is not good. When you've got money, you can buy land, you can send, you can build orphanages, you can do. Do not lay out for yourself trees in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in. So can I encourage you, allocate a part of your portfolio. Allocate part of your investments to heaven. You will get a really good return. This is the most powerful verse today. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you mean? Who, who owns shares? Mm, okay. We need to do some financial management here. Okay. Who has a Kiwi saver? Oh, we're doing a little better there. How often do you check your Kiwi saver? How often do you check the interest rates? How often do you check when it was going backwards a little while ago? Why? Because your heart's there. Because your treasure's there. When um, my mum, my mum was um, a founder of Lee Fisheries. Her name was Matheson, and there was another family, and they formed Lee Fisheries, and she got a whole lot of shares at a dollar. It started the thing, and uh, when she died, uh, she had eighteen hundred shares. I think at the time they were about twenty-five dollars, and um, and then as I was the executor of her will, I wrote to Lee Fisheries and said, "Could I divide these into five parcels to represent my five, my four other siblings?" And they said, "You can do that." And, and some of my siblings just quickly flicked theirs off, and I decided to hold mine, because I love going to the AGMs and they have a great lunch with seafood, and, <laughs> and I loved that learning about the relationship between leaf fish, they only line fish. And when you go to a restaurant and you order fish, ask them, how was it caught? If it's not line caught, order something else. We've got to sustain that fishery. Man, we're getting everything here this morning. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so anyway, uh, then a little while later, there were people trying to buy the shares. And, uh, and then uh, pack of, uh, no, foodstuffs came along and bought Lee Fish. I'm really glad I held those shares. They went for $79 each. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> and a free seafood lunch. <laughs> Lunches. See, what's... I, I followed the fish market. I understood the relationship between Lee Fish and Air New Zealand. They catch fish this morning. It's on the plane tonight. It's in the shops in LA fresh. Tomorrow morning, mum can go in and order a fresh fish. You know, I, I love following all that. Why? Because my, I've got an investment there. Where your heart is, where your treasure is. Okay. J Jesus does a brilliant job with a parable. Let me explain a parable. A parable is, a, is, a, is, a, is not a true story, but it's teaching a true story. When a parable uses a name, then it's a true story. But in this case, Jesus is teaching this parable. Luke 12, verse 16. And he told this parable, the ground of a, a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store. I want you to lock on to that word, my. My stuff. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down the barns, I'll build bigger barns, and they will store surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, hey, self, it's okay to talk to yourself. Sometimes you need good advice. Okay. You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. He just made a huge mistake. He thought he associated stuff with time. It doesn't work. The two don't go together. He says, take it easy 
eat, drink, and be merry. Now, if the story finished there, this would be great business advice and a great retirement package. And the Bible is all about strong work ethic, savings, leaving an inheritance to your children's children, all there. But now the parable or the story takes a sad twist. And I can tell you life does this. Some of you sitting in this church have experienced that. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The answer, not you. You're dead. I'm watching the life of Warren Buffett at the moment. Does anyone know Warren? Okay. Billionaire. I think he's worth about 200 billion or something. He's 93. Guess what? He's going to die. He could have given the 299 billion away to the kingdom and kept the billion for the funeral. That'd be a good funeral. Man, you guys aren't sparking very well today. And then God says, then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. And now Jesus brings a spiritual truth to this parable. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. That is not rich towards God. Well, Colin, what, what does that mean? Give me the how, Colin. I, I, I want the how. It's, it's coming. It's coming. Time's up and it's coming. <laughs> how do I build this heavenly portfolio? How do I invest in eternity when I get there and, and, and I hear these words from Matthew 25? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of the Lord. Oh, here's the first one. I'll get it quickly. Give yourself to God. That's how you make yourself rich towards God. You just give yourself to God. Go all in. That's how you become rich towards God. God isn't after your stuff. He wants you. And Jesus is saying, hey, Colin, I gave my life for you. Now my heavenly Father would love you to give your life to him and go all in. Now, we could say, well, that, not, not just the tithe. He actually gets everything associated with me. So when I give my heart to Jesus, it'd be a really good idea if he gets all of me and he gets all of you. This great quote by John Sutherland Bonnell. If one first gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. Peasy. And if you de develop this attitude towards God that it doesn't belong to you, earth will never have a grip on you. It's just temporary. Stuff will never have a grip on you. The love of money will never have a grip on you. What people think about you will never have a grip on you. I love the tithe. You will never be controlled with money. And I can say, you know, God, you, we, we, give, we give you the first 10%, but actually that's no, all yours. See, it's a different attitude. It's being rich towards God. And second one, quickly, have the attitude of a steward, or the word it can mean manager. You're not the owner. Boy, there's some people going to go home and wash and polish their cars and vacuum them today. <laughs> you act like a steward or a caretaker, a manager. You're not the owner. Lord, what do you want me to do? My house is the God's house. Look after it. Maintain it. My car is God's car. Maintain it. Look after it. I don't enjoy the tires too much. And when I buy something, you know, I search for the very, very best price. Can I tell you that we've had money invested with, in the bank, and when the term deposits come, we've got to sign a premier manager. Okay, it means there's just a sum of money there, but more than normal. Church money, your money that you've given. But I was entrusted to invest it. And, she would, and I would check the term deposit rates. I knew exactly what they were. I knew whose the other rates were. I knew I had my finger on the pulse. And she would ring up and say, hey, Colin, we've got a term deposit expiring. We need to reinvestment. The current rate is 4.0. Just for, okay? And she said, because it, it's because it's you guys, we can do a little better. We can do 4.1. 
at that point, I start coughing down the phone. <laughs> excuse me, her name was Marianne. Excuse me, excuse me. Sorry, I didn't hear. We got a bad line. What did you say? She now goes back and has another look at it, and I get another 0.25%. I just ordered new tape, 10 boxes of tape, 18 boxes in a roll. We've been paying $11 a roll for it. I found a new source, $8.50. So I just spent $1,800 of your money on tape. No, no, it's going to be silver. That's just some today. Camo's more expensive. See, well, I'm entrusted with God's money. So you get the very best deal for it. And when it comes to giving to legacy, the only thing I ask of you is go home and ask God what he will have you give. There will be no beat-ups. There will be no clips, violins playing, cherubs on clouds. But can I just say something? Can you hear this from my father's heart for the house? For whatever reason, there are people that call Causeway home that are unable to give anything. Now, I've got my finger on the pulse and I know exactly what that is. Could I tell you, forget legacy. Don't give to legacy. I'd go home and reevaluate my finances and ask for help and just start with a small percentage because it just takes nuts and bolts. There's a new cable bought for here the other day, $102. It just takes nuts and bolts to run this place. Just start giving a little bit. Is that, can, you, can you receive that today? Forget about legacy. And please don't go and borrow money. I had some friends got, got a beat up and they went and put a whole lot of money on their credit card to give to a, a building thing. Don't do that. I'd rather you gave nothing. And just put a, put a note in say, here's my $5. God gets it. The widows might. <laughs> and these people dug themselves such a financial hole out of emotion. Don't do that. Just go home and say, God... And, and, and Lord, can we do our finances a little smarter? A cup of coffee a week. There's 300 bucks. No, no, a year. Sorry, I... I <laughs> Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That includes me and you. The world is all its people belong to him. Well, Colin, I've worked hard for everything I have. Fantastic. What a, what a great witness to have a, a really strong work ethic. And I'm all for giving, I'm all for saving, and I'm all for spending to live. But Deuteronomy 8.18 8, says, and it's amazing, As you shall remember the Lord your God, for he is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he establishes his covenant with, he swore to your fathers and to this day. Gospel. It's, who's breathing at the moment? We have got uh, medics here and, and, a, and a shocker. Who put the breath in your lungs? Who put the ideas in your head? Who gave you the ability to think? And if you live your life with the attitude of a steward or a manager, it's a game changer. So we give, we give our lives to God. We become stewards. We become rich towards God. And then the last one, and can of the worship team, view everything through the lens of eternity. We are here for a brief moment. Every person will see, every person you see, their soul matters. The lady making the coffee at the coffee shop that you're not going to buy once a week. <laughs> Her soul matters. His soul matters. My thoughts, my action, my speech, all through the lens of eternity. My serving, my giving, all through the lens of eternity. Moses was raised in a palace. So I haven't got time to tell the story. You can read it in Exodus he was born to a Hebrew mum. She popped him in a little basket in the creek. The Pharaoh's daughter picked him up, took him back to the palace, then hunted around for someone to feed the little baby. First biblical case of paid parental leave. <laughs> and it says, and then Hebrew, Moses could have laid, stayed in the palace partying up, but he, he said, no, 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 no. Moses chose to be mistreated, Hebrews 11.25, along with the people of God, Rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his... Have you grabbed it, church? Last one, be intentional. I want each of you, 2 Corinthians 9, 
I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your mind what you will give. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church. And you know what? Enjoy. Be a cheerful giver. Let's have fun getting this done. And then we'll get on to the next project. How many times from time to time you've, I'll just talk about me, where you've wasted money. I can look around my farm and bits and pieces and, man, that was a waste of money. Didn't get that right. That was kind of a poor investment. That didn't work out. Church, that happens. That's life. Learn from the mistake. Try not to make it again. You will never miss what you invest in eternity. So let's store up our treasures in heaven. Give yourselves to God. And let's go.